just going to um, pray for Charles before he speaks. Yeah, Father God, we, we thank you for Charles and, and the work that he has prepared for us today. We were um, praying earlier and we asked that what Charles has to say today just falls on our ears, Lord, that there will be a word or a couple of words or maybe the whole thing that we just need to hear today. So God, let us have open hearts and open minds and ears to, to what Charles has prepared for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good morning, church. Happy to see everybody. It's a joy to be here again. Uh, as a matter of fact, this morning whilst we're praying, you are actually in the spirit. You said something that was just thinking about the same thing. And you said, I said, wow, look at that. Isn't that amazing? Fantastic. Father, thank you for this opportunity to speak to your people, oh Lord my God. We know the love that you have for your people, Lord. Love of, that surpasses all human understanding. Thank you, Lord, that you speak through me this morning, less of me and more of you. Let your people hear your word this morning and let them be changed into what you want them to be and how you want them to be, Lord. We trust in your unfitting love and mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, what I'm going to do this morning is, um, firstly, I'm going to be reading from the Amplified. The Amplified Bible takes the original Greek text and then it translates it with huge emphasis, helping us to understand the original thought and intent of the writers. And then I'll be expressing some more with some of the notes that I've prepared for everybody this morning. Firstly, uh, just before I start, there are three types of true given. The first is given. And this is where you give of your substance or you give of yourself. The second form of giving, believe it or not, is forgiving. This is where you forgive. And we all know the importance of forgiveness. To those who have hurt us, and those who have offended us, we are mandated and commanded by the Lord that we must release them. So first form of giving, giving of your substance, money, material, or giving of yourself. Second form of giving, for giving, without which true inspiration and blessing of the Lord will not flow. And the third true type of giving is thanksgiving. So try and remember those three, giving, forgiving, thanksgiving. The other point I want to make real quick as we get into our word today is the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus Christ did not come to talk to us about religion. He didn't come to talk to us truly about being born again. The entire scripture, there's only once he mentioned being born again. And we all know that, the gentleman and the uh, Nicodemus that came to him in the night. It's the only time the Lord talked about being born again. The Lord came to talk to us about the kingdom of God. If you read the New Testament and the four Gospels, you will notice consistently that the Lord Jesus Christ emphasized the kingdom of God, where he has come from. And that's what the world is really looking for today, a kingdom that can heal, a kingdom that forgives, a kingdom that can create. Now, it's important to understand this, but where is the kingdom today? In the Old Testament, the father lived in sanctuaries built by human hands, synagogues, sanctuaries, so on and so forth. But today, where does he live? Where does he live? He lives in you and I. The Lord lives in you and I. So what does that mean? That means when you go to work, the kingdom is present. When you get into, into an airplane, the kingdom is present. When you get into a taxi, into shops, into schools, 
into your places of work, the kingdom of God is right there. Now, I just wanted to break it down this way, just so, you know, we, we kind of make it simple. So wherever you are, if you are a born-again believer, the kingdom of God is present right there. It's up to you and I to realize it and then to operate and function like we truly believe the kingdom is there and present. Praise God. So John 17 is a very interesting chapter. The Lord Jesus Christ taught us about what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. But the Lord's Prayer was not a prayer that he prayed for himself. When the disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. He then taught them how to pray the Lord's Prayer. But that's not his prayer. John chapter 17 has actually been called the high priestly prayer. This is the real prayer, the longest prayer recorded of our Lord Jesus Christ, where he really prayed. So my theme or, my theme or title for my message today could be the Lord prays for us, or the high priestly prayer. He prayed for three things, which is very, very important in that entire John chapter 17. From verse 1 to 5, he prayed for himself, asking the Father to glorify him. Because this was just the day before his passion, before he was crucified. So he was praying for the huge work that he has done. From verse 6 to 19, he prayed for his disciples, asking the Father to sanctify them. Sanctification means to be set apart for special work, to be made holy by God. So they would do what God has called them to do. So he prayed for them. And that was the longest prayer. If you look at this chapter from 6 to 19, was praying for the disciples. And most of us know what happened to the disciples. From 20 to 26, he prayed for you and I. The Lord actually prayed for you and I. If you want to find out where you are in the Bible, you'll find him praying for you in those verses, 20 to 26. And guess what he prayed for? Unity, which I'll come to in a moment. So John 17 records Jesus' prayer of intercession, called the high priestly prayer for his disciples and also for all who will believe in him and be saved. In his prayer, the Lord prays that God the Father will be glorified through him. Father, Jesus prayed for his own glorification before men that the truth of his being sent by God or God incarnate in the flesh will be seen and believed by everybody. So let me just read a little bit just in terms of context before we get to our focus text for today. So as I said, read, you just kind of listen and take it in. <laughs> Verse one says, when Jesus had spoken these things, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify and exalt and honor and magnify your son so that your son may glorify and extol and honor and magnify you. Just as you have granted him power and authority over all flesh, all humankind. Now glorify him so that he may be giving eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. It means to know, to perceive, to recognize, to become acquainted with and understand God. That is eternal life. The only true and real God, and likewise to know him, Jesus, as the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, whom you have sent. Verse 4, Father, I have glorified you down here on earth by completing the work that you gave me 
to do. And now, Father, glorify me along with yourself and restore to me such majesty and honor in your presence as I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name. I have revealed your very self, your real self, to the people whom you have given me out of this world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have obeyed and kept your word. Now at last, they know and understand that all you have given me belongs to you. It's really and truly yours, all that you have given to me. For the words that you gave me, my utterances, I have given them, and they have received and accepted them, and have come to know positively and in reality to believe with absolute assurance that I came forth from you. I am praying for them. I am not praying, requesting for the world. But for those you have given me, for they belong to you. I am not praying for the world. I am praying for those you have put within my care. Not for the world. All things that are mine are yours, and all things that are yours belong to me, and I am glorified in through them. So as we begin to understand the focus of our Lord Jesus Christ's prayer, this is the longest prayer, as I mentioned, the entirety of, verse, of chapter 17. So let us now jump forward to verse 17. The Lord began by saying, Father, sanctify them, purify, consecrate, separate them for yourself. Make them holy by truth. Your word is truth. His word is not a truth. In our politically correct era we are living in now, his word is not some truth. His word does not contain a measure of truth. His word is truth. Verse 18, just as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I also have sent them into the world. The Father sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. For what reason? To reveal the character of God to man. To reveal the personality of God to man. Because you and I cannot comprehend, understand, or contain God in his true essence. The Bible doesn't tell us the Lord lives in heaven. As a matter of fact, we are told that the Heavenly Father lives in unapproachable light. That means you and I as humans cannot behold the Father in his true nature. There's no way we can understand God. So he had to send Jesus Christ in human flesh to give us an indication of who he is. We are told in Hebrews 1, 3 that he is the brightness, the express image of God the Father, the brightness of God the Father. So we could see God through Jesus Christ or else we could never as humans see God, understand, neither can we fathom who he is. So the Lord Jesus Christ came to show us the character of God. As the Lord prayed, he realized that he would soon be going to heaven. But future generations will still need some witness concerning God. This work must be done through believers by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's asking, Father, 
just as you sent me into the world, I am also sending them. So let's jump to verse 20, our text for today. The Lord said, neither for these alone do I pray. It is not for their sake only that I make this request, but also for all those who will ever come to believe in, trust in, cling to, rely on me through their word and teaching. Now our high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ, extended his prayer beyond the disciples he prays now for generations yet unborn. In fact, every believer reading this verse can truthfully say, Jesus prayed for me nearly 2,000 years ago. Verse 21, that they all may be one just as you, Father, and I are one, just as you are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe and be convinced that you have sent me. The prayer was for unity among believers, but this time it was the salvation of sinners in mind. The unity our Lord prayed about was not for the external church union, but rather for a unity based on common moral likeness. As we reflect on these verses, the Lord is not praying for uniformity. Uniformity essentially is coercing, forcing people to be like each other. Okay? That's not what the Lord is praying for. The Lord understands the differences in everybody, but he's praying for unity. You and I, we have several things we disagree with. Some of you in this very audience may not believe that the Lord still heals today. I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. Some of you may not believe in speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues, but you may disagree with that. I believe in healing, but you may disagree with that. Some of you may not believe in baptism. Some of you may not believe that a female could be a preacher or a priest or a bishop. It's true. There are churches who don't agree with that. Some of you may not like me because I have the wrong color from you. I don't care, but I'm just saying you may not believe that. There are black people who don't like white people. There are white people who don't like black people or Chinese or Indian people. And they are Christians, by the way. So the Lord understands all of that. The point he's making is whatever your differences Still love, still love, whether you believe she can be a preacher or not, still love her. Whether you believe she could be a bishop or not, still love her. Even though you don't agree, still love her. Whether you don't like that Asian, still love him. Why? You're going to see why in a moment, okay? So verse 22 I have given to them the glory and honor which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 22. What is that glory? As God the Father shared his glory with the Son, so Jesus gave glory unto his people. There are many ways that Jesus gives his glory to his people. One, the glory of his presence, the glory of his word, the glory of his spirit, the glory of his power, 
the glory of his leadership, the glory of his preservation. These are ways he gives his glory. The glory of Jesus was ultimately displayed in his work on the cross. Jesus often referred to that as his glorification. That they may be one, the presence of glory among the persons of the Godhead and the member of the Jesus church, this glory contributes to the oneness and unity of God's people. Where there is a sense of God's glory, unity is so much easier. Lesser things that often divide us are set far in the background when there is a sense of God's glory at work. Verse 23, I in them and you in me and in other that they may be and may become one, perfectly united. And this is the key. That the world may know and definitely recognize that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. So the greatest witness to the entire world is when they see those Christians, in spite of their differences, demonstrating so much love for people. God is saying that the way the world can tell if we are true believers, if we can demonstrate the awesomeness of the work that he has done here on earth before he left, that the proof, the vindication of his work on the earth is when the world, not Christians, the world observe how those Christians love themselves and love people. He is saying that is the way they can tell that he, Jesus Christ, is true. What an awesome responsibility. Think about it. But further, there was a point here I wanted to emphasize. That you have loved them as you have loved me. Let me say this to you. We have and we think about our Lord Jesus Christ and we know him as our Savior King. The Bible says that he is the only begotten of the Father. The only begotten of the Father. The Father loved Jesus Christ like nothing else. But I want to say something to you today. Do you know that the same love the Father has for Jesus is exactly the same love he has for you? <laughs> I know some of you, no, 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 no. He, loved, he loved Jesus Christ more. No, I'm telling you, according to scripture, that you, 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 yes, sir, you, yes, you as well, you, 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 all of you in this room right now, the same love the Lord has for Jesus Christ is exactly the same love he has for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, but you don't understand where I've come from, what I've done, what my, yeah, yeah. Christ has paid for that old life. It's paid for it in full. You can never do anything about that. You could never pay for it. The Lord paid for it. When God sees you, he says Christ. <laughs> I need to emphasize this. Forgive me, all right? You must say Charles, that's elementary. Let me emphasize it nonetheless. When God looks at Jesus Christ, our King, our Savior, who was sinless when he walked this earth, he sees you. I mean, this is, the, this is the message of the gospel. This is how awesome it is. This is what people can never understand. You don't have to roll on the floor. You don't have to cut your, your, your arms with knives like some of those other religions do. You don't have to have chaplet and go through it and walk on your knees all, all, all day long. You don't have to roll and put ash. You don't have to do all that stuff. The Lord says if you believe in your heart, and confess out of your mouth that Jesus is the Christ and he is your Lord and your Savior, 
you are saved. That's the work you have to do. You are saved. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have entrusted to me as your gift to me, may be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus desires to have his people with himself in glory. Every time a believer dies, it is in a sense an answer to this prayer. This should comfort us when we lose loved ones. The Lord desires for his people to be with him in glory. So when we lose loved ones, we know where they are going and where they are in glory with our Lord Jesus Christ. There must be something so deep, so enthralling, so vast that it can occupy the attention of God's people in eternity. This is also the glory he acquired as our savior and redeemer. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus said this in connection with the glory that God the Father gave to God the Son. This glory was given in the context of a love relationship and a love relationship extending into eternity past. This tells us that before anything was created, there was a love relationship between the persons of the Godhead. Even if Jesus had not specifically told us this, we might have understood it by other biblical truths. Understanding that God is eternal and that God is love. He doesn't have love. He is love. There was never a time when God did not love and was not love. Genuine love must have an object outside of itself to love. Therefore, love existed between the persons of the Godhead before anything was created. The triune nature of God is a not only scripturally correct, it is a logical necessity given what we know of God through his revealed word. And as I begin to conclude triumphantly. Let's look at verse 25. Oh, just and righteous Father, although the world has not known you and has failed to recognize you and has never acknowledged you, I have known you. And these men and women understand and know that you have sent me. Jesus was about to go to the cross and undergo the entire ordeal of his passion. All of it planned and sent by God the Father. Yet Jesus, full of love and honor towards God the Father, cried out in concluding this prayer, O righteous Father, O oh, righteous Father, even though he was about to be nailed to the cross, he still declared God, O oh, righteous Father. Jesus understood that his present and soon to be endured pain did not diminish the righteousness of God, even in the smallest possible way. He said, the world has not known you, but I have known you. Jesus understood both that the world did not know and understand God the Father and that he did not, that he did know and understand him. And these have known that you sent me. Jesus repeated the idea first mentioned earlier on. Whatever their weaknesses and feelings, the disciples understood that God the Father sent God the Son. I have declared to them your name. 
Jesus ended this great prayer on a note of faith and triumph. He knew that he had done his work and will finish his course. In one sense, the entire work of Jesus could be summed up in saying that he declared to the disciples and to the world the name of God the Father. That is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The world called Jesus a blasphemer. They called him a drunk. They called him a gluten and an associate of sinners, a demon-possessed pagan, and an illegitimate child. Jesus believed none of it because none of it was true. At the end, he could confidently say, I have declared to them your name and will continue to declare it. Verse 26, that the love with which you loved me may be in them. Jesus received love from God the Father and this love relationship was the strength and sustenance of his life. Concluding this great prayer, Jesus prayed that the same love that was his strength and sustenance will fill his disciples and you and I. This speaks to the essential place of love in the Christian life and community. Jesus thought it so important that he specifically prayed for love. When he might have prayed for other things, he spent his time praying for love. When people accept the Father as he is revealed by the Lord Jesus Christ, they become special object of God's love. Since all believers have the indwelling of the Lord and the Holy Spirit, God looks upon them and treats them as he treats his only son. So as a roundup, what is the greatest evidence for the world to see, know, and recognize that you and I are true Christians, true believers, and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's not by our prayer only, it's not by our speaking of religious world. Oh, bless you, bless you, brother. Bless you, sister. Bless you. He said that we may love one another. That is how the heathen, the pagans, observing out there will say, wow, these are true followers of Jesus. These are true believers of their faith. See how they love each other. God bless you.